Here we go. All right, so uh, again, for those of you uh, who are just joining, um, thank you again on behalf of myself, I'm uh, Dr. Dana Collins. I am the president of the New York Association of Black Psychologists. Uh, thank you on behalf of uh, the board for joining us. Uh, we are going to start tonight's event with a, um, an African-centered opening ritual. And we like to do this to open up the space to um, invite our ancestors to be with us and support us. So I'm going to turn it over um, to our uh, one of our past presidents, Dr. Lisa Witten. Thank you, Lisa. Good evening, everyone, or Hotep, as we say, that's a greeting that we use, especially um, at our national events. We'd like to start with just a, a few minutes, a few moments really, um, of mindfulness from an African-centered perspective um, to just get ourselves grounded. There's so much going on and we wanna just get ourselves centered and uh, prepare ourselves for the discussion we're about to have. So just close your eyes for a short moment Take a couple deep breaths and center yourself. And we'd like to thank the Creator and the ancestors for making it possible for us to be here tonight. We thank our ancestors for being there so that we can stand on their shoulders and continue the struggle to liberate our people. I'd like everyone to uh, reflect on one of your ancestors who can give you wisdom, creativity, and a good frame of mind to enter into this discussion of some very complex issues. Ashe. Ashe. Let it be so. All right. So, did we arrange for an introduction of our speaker? Or? Oh, yes. Oh, thank you for that, Lisa. <laughs> All right. So, uh, our discussion tonight will be facilitated by uh, Dr. Tanya White Davis. Uh, but before we turn um, it over for our discussion, I just wanted to say a few brief words about um, our chapter, the New York Association of Black Psychologists. So our mission is um, uh, the liberation of the African mind, the empowerment of the African character, and the enlightenment and illumination of the African spirit. So this uh, tonight's event will be focusing specifically on liberation of our minds. Uh, so we will be talking about um, what, um, how we confront white fragility and how we respond to it. So we're hoping that uh, we'll be able to share and hear each other's experiences um, and learn some ways for, for navigating it, um, sort of coping with it. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to our speaker, Dr. Tanya White Davis, who is one of our, uh, one of NYABC's past presidents. Thank you, Tanya. Hey, thank you so much, Dr. Collins. So, um, hello everyone, good evening. Um, I just also want to start by saying that this is going to be a conversation. Hopefully it will be a conversation. So I invite everyone to um, unmute themselves when they would like to have a comment, a question, provide any um, thoughts about their experience because that's what's really going to be the meat of this, of this time together. Um, I thought we'd just start by reading through, I'm gonna read through an article that um, was put out in the New York Times and it really, in, in June 5th, which really um, highlighted a big part of what we're gonna be talking about and what we um, often encounter when it comes to white fragility and how that works in our spaces. Um, I then will hopefully open it up for a conversation that will spark us to um, have some thoughts and ideas and 
you know, then kind of talk a little bit about uh, what white fragility is, just so we can make sure that we are all on the same page, have the same language. Um, and, you know, kind of thinking about how that manifests in this time period that we're in right now. Um, I want to first acknowledge, um, you know, the time that we are in and um, the many black and brown um, brothers and sisters who we've lost and um, through police brutality, through murder, um, through mass incarceration, all of the ways in which we've been oppressed as people. So um, I acknowledge that and raise up their, their names, their spirit. Um, I identify as um, Black American, um, Black Jamaican American. My pronouns are she, her. So first, um, I'm going to go back and forth between screen share and this uh, lovely gallery view so everyone can see each other's faces and we can have a conversation. So we'll be doing that throughout this time. First, I'd like to start with this article by Chad Sanders that was contributed to the New York Times opinion section. Um, and it was a conversation that uh, he had with his publisher um, around a book that he was going to be putting out for the Black community. And this was, again, June 5th. It was around the time when George Floyd was murdered and these are, uh, and the protests began. He writes, my agent was pushing back a meeting necessary for the completion and timely release of my book which is about how Black people can apply the lessons we derive from traumatic experiences to our careers so that white people can reflect on how to help Black people. Mm -hmm. I, I countered, insisting that our meeting take place and as, as scheduled because Black people's lives are in danger and I shouldn't have to sacrifice momentum on a book written for Black people because white people are performing empathy. This agency's behavior is common right now. White people are pushing me and others like me aside to alleviate their own guilt and prove that they are different from Derek Chauvin, the fire police officers charged with murdering George Floyd in Minneapolis, and Amy Cooper, who tried to weaponize her whiteness by calling the police on Christian Cooper, a bird watcher in Central Park. Black people are being trampled in the process. Many white people I know are spilling over with guilt and overzealous attempts to offer sympathy. I have been avoiding them as best I can, trying to live, support my Black family and friends, and execute normal life functions, such as working, moving into a new apartment, and cooking dinner for my girlfriend. But brazen as ever, white people who have, who have my phone number are finding a way to drain my time and energy. Some are friends, others old co-workers and acquaintances I've intentionally released from my life for the sake of my peace of mind. Every few days, I receive a bunch of texts like this one from the last week. Quote, hi friend, I just wanted to reach out and let you know I love you and so deeply appreciate you in my, my, my life and your stories in the world. And I'm so sorry. This country is deeply broken and sick and racist. I'm sorry. I think I'm tired. Meanwhile, I'm sleeping my Snuggie of white privilege. I love you and I'm here to fight and be useful in any way I can be heart emojis. Almost every message ends with seven oppressive words. Quote, don't feel like you need to respond, end quote. Not only are these people using me as a waste bin for guilt and shame, but they're silencing me in the process. In an unusually honest admission of power and balance, the texter is informing me I don't have to respond. Gee, thanks. This implies that whether or not I do respond, and I usually don't, the transaction is complete because the message has been conveyed. The texter can sleep more soundly in a snuggie of white privilege. So I'm wondering if we have any, anyone have any thoughts about that? Any comments about what you what you heard does that resonate with anyone you know and again, i again please feel free to 
Yes, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. I didn't mention that because we have a, such a large group, we're going to ask everyone to use the chat function um, if, uh, to make a contribution. Um, and one of our members, uh, Dr. Marjorie Beverly Lashley, uh, will ma uh, manage the chat box. Thank you. Have a comment or a reaction to that. I had a thought actually about the um, the notion of you don't have to respond. Uh, because I hadn't interpreted or thought of it in the way that um, the uh, quote described. So the quote was saying that um, that idea, that statement means that the transaction is complete. And I personally, I have um, liked uh, when people have said you don't need to respond because by expecting a response, it, it asks for more sort of emotional labor for me. And oftentimes I don't want to, I don't necessarily want to talk about what's happening for me or, or I don't want to process that person's feelings. So that's a really interesting um, idea. Just wanted right. to share that. I also have someone just um, said, I have had that experience and I'm never sure how to respond to these types of texts. I appreciate the support from my white friends, but it also feels disingenuous. Mm -hmm. And then another person says, it makes me angry. I've experienced it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah, so thank you um, for those comments. I, I think, you know, this is something that a lot of people might have experienced, especially at the beginning of the protest. I know my, myself, it's kind of what prompted me to think about this is, um, you know, I also received tons of emails and texts um, in with similar, similar context. I see a hand raised as well um, from Stephen. I might, I'm sorry if I, um, but your last name, Tarasiano. Well, you said that very nicely. Uh, can you hear me? Am I? Yes, yeah. yes, I can hear you. Oh, okay, sure. Well, thanks for uh, offering up this conversation tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, and I totally could understand why um, this person would feel the way that they that they do uh, in receiving those texts. At the same time, um, as a white man, I'm trying to figure out how do I connect? Um, how do I show solidarity and support uh, without feeling like I'm damned if I don't say anything? Am I not caring if I say something? Will they find the one word that turns them the wrong way. So um, I get it. Um, you know, it's a work in progress. Um, but I'm just hoping that we can all find a way uh, to be together and uh, support one another, um, respecting each other's experience. And yeah, I guess I do feel guilty. Like, you know, I don't want to have this white privilege. <laughs> That's an interesting point because someone said, I think true support involves a display of sacrifice and discomfort mm -hmm. in challenging the status quo. And someone else said, but I agree. I usually don't want to engage because I do not want to be angered by the insensitivity and obliviousness. And I guess that's also a big part of what we'll be talking about in regards to white fragility is that um, you know, what is the, the real purpose behind the um, text or the email? In part, the solidarity, the um, wanting to show care for people who, you, who are in your life, and simultaneously, um, it might also act to assuage um, some level of white fragility. And that's a, that's a difficult balance, but it's also an important balance, especially when you're um, faced with large institutions, large um, situations that um, put everyone in a face of racism so bluntly and so um, explicitly that 
it may not be the time mm -hmm. for that. Right. Um, and acknowledging where that might be coming from is going to be very important. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. I wanted to know, Jamila, if you had any, Dr. Codrington, if you had any other, um, if you wanted to expand on your thought as well. Uh, sure. Good evening, everyone. Um, I think that it this is a very difficult and challenging um, process in terms of, you know, how do we uh, create a experience of solidarity and an experience of having what people would consider white allies in the struggle. Um, and I want to thank you, Stefan, for, you know, sharing that intention and willingness to do that. Um, I think that I see this through a trauma lens. And I think that when I think about it as a, um, as a therapist coming from a, um, a trauma lens, I think about um, the difference between um, sometimes interventions that are helpful but not well-timed because the um, survivor is not ready um, to really have any discussion around the content or maybe um, they're going through um, a experience where they need to um, work within safe spaces um, and not sort of work to create alliances, you know, or make amends with their perpetrator. Um, so if, if that helps to, to really, for me, put it in perspective, I think that um, the healing process requires different things at different times of the journey. Um, and it doesn't always mean that the goal is to be neck and neck, having this, you know, sharing the same experiences at the same time. Um, and so that's why I was thinking that there are things that involve um, sacrifice and discomfort that are really important for white allies to do um, that we may not have the emotional energy to you know to do and to fight that battle um, and so that's to me a very um, viable place um, to be on the front lines and to, to have the difficult conversations to um, fight for policy changes you, you know so that the emotional care sometimes can um, can be done in a in a way where people experience safety and don't have to worry about translating their pain, which is a lot of emotional energy. Okay. I see a hand raise. Um, Stephen, you had your, um, Kim Irby, would you like to make a contribution? Um, greetings, everyone. Um, greetings. I just want to understand that where were people beforehand? Like, this, I don't know what it is about the in this murder on national, you know, on the web that now everybody wants to come to our rescue. Like, I don't know why we didn't have the same outcry for Eleanor Bumpers, you know, and all the ones before so that's why people come in on board now and they say, we didn't know. I just can't give people a pass on that. I feel like when they say to you, oh, well, we really didn't know, it's like they want me to say, oh, I understand. You know what I mean? Like they want me to make them feel better because now they are admitting that they didn't know, you know, that, that the racism was on this level, right? Yeah. I just kind of feel like it's not that you didn't know, you just didn't care enough. Mm -hmm. You know, Black lives really didn't matter to you for whatever reason. And because the light bulb comes on with you, now you, you know, you want me to now accept that you didn't know. So I, I struggle with that. I, I can't, I can't give, you know, my friends that kind of passed because someone did say that to me. It was like, I didn't know. I'm like, yes, you did. <laughs> it, it, it's not the first time. I think one of the things we have to come to grips with is that this was not a movie we were watching. This was in real time. 
that we actually saw someone being murdered in front of us in real time, not footage from a video, but in real time. And it shocked the consciousness of everybody who was watching it. It traumatized us, you know, but we're people of color or individuals who self-identify with the African diaspora. Their attitude is, this is what has been happening to us. This is what we have seen all the time. But you have other ethnic groups are saying, oh my God, I didn't know. Well, now you know. So where do we go from here? And I think the main part about, you know, not knowing is what does it mean to not pay attention, mm -hmm. to not have to pay attention, to not need to recognize. Right. Um, and I think that's the kind of insidiousness of, of white fragility um, and white supremacy cultures, that the world is um, organized in a way that you don't need to see. As, as a white person. And that can be jarring, hence the white fragility that we're gonna talk about in a second, um, when confronted with that. And so what happens, what do you do with that, um, that confrontation? And where the confrontation is concerned, um, Stephen said, children appeared to be looking straight into the lens of the camera as he knelt. It was as though it was a deer. So what? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I'm just going to quickly go through some of the um, uh, definitions. Just to, again, make sure we are all on the same page when we are um, talking about white fragility. Um, let me just make sure I can do this here. Um, so white fragility, um, as explained also in, in Dr. Robin D'Angelo's book, um, is this phenomenon of socialization um, for white people that influences their reactions and actions uh, when faced with racial stresses. Um, and it holds racism in place. It's part of the mechanism that holds racism in place and makes it um, something that's maintained in our society. She explicitly talks about the um, difficulty for, especially for white progressives, to um, fully understand their impact on people of color. Um, and she also describes um, white progressives as specifically um, being the group that could cause the most daily damage to people of color. Um, she defines white progressive and as any white person who believes themselves to be not racist or less racist or is in other, is in the choir or um, already gets it. Um, and part of the danger being that um, most of the energy is put into making sure everyone else knows that they get it, um, except instead of putting that energy into getting it on a daily basis for the rest of their life. Um, and so this could lead to performative acts um, without lasting changes. So I'm wondering um, if we can talk a little bit about how does this relate to what we're seeing in this time period right now? in the world today. And again, feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, one thing that I see as a parallel uh, is people demonstrating to post on media that they're demonstrating. Um, it seems like there's a huge, um, I understand the importance of documenting history uh, but I have been to and been around a number of um, protests and it really incenses me that it seems like people want to just be on display to show that they're kind of down for the cause um, and I, I can't even imagine 
um, what it would have been like if I had actually lost someone personally and then see people, you know, with the camera and the shirt and like, sometimes I read people's profiles and, you know, it's performative, you know, and I um, don't know. And it's, it's across the board, you know, across all racial ethnic groups. Um, and so for me, that that's definitely a parallel to, to what you're saying in terms of um, the difference between something that's a lifestyle change and something that's performative. The documentation of the protesting and the photo ops around it. Mm -hmm. And we have a comment that um, our sister Irby said, we see young people uprising and expressing their rage and looking for answers or relief. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can be very challenging to, especially if you've lost somebody, you know, to police brutality, to any type of violence in a violent way. Um, and then see kind of performative acts, you know, selfies being taken with the shirts. And, um, and I can imagine that being very challenging. And it also, how do we then, um, I guess, think about allyship? And what does that look like? When does that come into play? I just wanna really quickly comment on uh, something that Dr. Codrington uh, uh, stated, uh, especially in terms of the performative aspect of demonstrating and, and posting. I, I think um, that it's really important, and I think this has been sort of alluded to in this conversation, that it's really important that uh, white people, white allies, all allies are really in touch with why they're doing what they're doing, what their intentions are, what they are hoping to, um, I don't want to use the word achieve because that sounds a little bit uh, self-serving, but what they are hoping to, that will happen as a result of them becoming involved. So I, I think a lot of self-reflection is needed. That's an, an excellent starting point. And I just want to add that one of the things that D'Angelo wrote about is that even um, when people try to feel as though they're authentic um, or well-intentioned, are they not perpetuating white supremacy? Because there's this issue of colorblindness, you know, that race shouldn't really matter. And that prevents us from getting down with how it does matter. And that's something that we have to deconstruct. Absolutely. It's part of what she mentions in her book on white fragility is that white fragility in and of itself can be um, a form of white racial control. And it could be weaponized defensive, defensiveness. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we can think about is like, what does it mean to kind of sit in that discomfort? What does it mean to actually continue to um, know that when you march that has implications, know that when you are trying to be an ally, doing that in a way that is um, driven by and guided by mm -hmm. people of color might be very important. Right. So, um, and continuously man maintaining the journey of understanding white, your own white privilege, your own whiteness right. um, is a big part of, of trying to combat on a daily basis the ways in which white fragility manifests in your life. Um, and I think one of the things that um, is a big part of that performativeness that we might be seeing at this point in time, and I've seen it in my own setting, uh, my own work setting, I see it a lot as far as the performative nature of, um, you know, what people are doing to see how you're doing on a daily basis or to, um, you know, send an email to someone, send a resource to someone, you know, those could be important, but also could be performative. And one of the things that she talks about is the good, bad binary. And where one of the defensive kind of portions of white fragility is 
um, that also impact, if it's also a barrier to talking about racism, um, is that people equate racism, white people especially equate racism with being bad or the bad extreme acts um, of interpersonal racist acts, which allows to um, kind of separate from racism because you're not bad, you are good, a good person. Um, and nice and good people can't be racist. Um, and so that's kind of what we, um, as people of color, if you identify as a person of color, if you identify as a black person, are being faced with that kind of bubbling um, confrontation that's happening that then impacts us. Yeah. Um, and so it's almost as if on a daily basis, especially in spaces, maybe at work, for instance, that there's this secondary language or secondary level of being that um, we often have to endure. Sometimes, you know, in, in literature, it's called um, code switching. There's multiple ways in which we code switch just to get by. Um, and so how do we then manage that level of fragility that might be going on or the good, bad binary that we might be seeing in our daily lives? Yeah. Dr. Whitten, I see your hand is raised. Yes, I think um, it's important to focus on the experience of uh, black people pe and people of color. And what you were just getting to, I think really connects with what, what I was thinking. The, um, the energy that we often expend just reacting to white fragility and what, what do we need to do to sort of um, steal ourselves so that it doesn't have such an impact so that we can keep going and deal with our own feelings and the issues that we think are important. And I think some of that has to do with thinking about um, good ways of responding briefly and um, uh, succinctly yeah. to, to these, um, this outreach that we're receiving uh, that, so that we can then get back to our feelings and, and the, the senses of, uh, the issues that we're dealing with personally. And this is one of the dilemmas that Black women are faced with, that we have become the repository, that we have to hold everything and help everyone to heal. And my question is, who is healing the healer? Okay, mm -hmm. that we have to protect ourselves and try to be able to understand what's going on. Um, one of the, um, one, we have a chat. I always struggle with the concept of allyship. What does it look like to use your power or privilege in the service of others? As a black woman, I struggle with dealing with responding to white fragility. I either tend to ignore it or crush it all together, one extreme or the other. What would your suggestions be for us as black people to deal with it, navigating it. I don't want to be angry all the time or navigating this all the time. Yes, thank you, Lisa, because I don't want this to be about deconstructing, legitimizing or validating white fragility. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And that's exactly where we don't want it to go, is right. validating white fragility. The point is to kind of move towards understanding what it is that we, how we are impacted. Um, and so that means, you know, if we are getting, this is just one thought that I was having, if you are getting those emails, um, like uh, uh, Chad was mentioning in his article, not having to respond and not feeling like we have to respond. Um, but if they are, he also makes a couple suggestions in his article. Um, he says three suggestions on more immediate, impactful things to do instead of offering uh, your good, your good vibes and positive vibes in the text to funds um, 
to send money, funds that pay legal fees or black people who are unjustly arrested, imprisoned or killed or to black politicians running for office. Text to your relatives and loved ones telling them you will not be visiting them or answering phone calls until they take significant action in supporting black lives either through protests or financial contributions. Protection to fellow black protesters who are at great, greater risk of harm during demonstrations. So he was suggesting in his article, don't, tell, don't send me the text, actually do the work. Focus it on some of these areas where that is, that's putting your action instead of saying just your words. Um, and maybe that would also free us up to actually focus on where we need to focus, which is our own um, um, emotional well-being and being able to move towards a fuller sense of humanity. One of the things that um, I also was struck by this kind of article was how much effort that, that we often take um, and energy to just kind of manage what's happening outside manage the, the impact that we're having by white supremacy culture. And simultaneously oppressing a part of our own humanity. Right. And that's, that's the oppressive nature of, suppress, of white supremacy culture. Yeah. Um, just for interest of time, I'm gonna move forward a little bit. It's one um, quick that we have a couple of comments. We're currently dealing with a system that gives white privilege that black, blacks can't get. Natural human relationship is better than allyship. And one of the things I just wanted to make clear that when I talk about deconstructing, that maybe it's a matter of clarifying because when we look at skin color, it affords white privilege. Be clear on that, right? Why when you look at us that we are viewed based on our racial identity. So there's a difference there and this needs to be clarified. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to kind of provide, in, in the essence of talking about um, this code switching that occurs and, and the ways in which um, throughout generations We've had to modify ourselves in order to be able to survive the white supremacy culture that we live in. Um, I wanted to show this video. Hopefully I can get this up and running. One moment. And maybe we can react to this as well. I have uh, written a poem for a woman who rides a bus in New York City. Uh oh. Ah, okay. Sorry about that. One moment. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> When the bus stops abruptly, she laughs. If the bus stops slowly, she laughs. If the bus picks up someone, she laughs. If the bus misses someone, she <laughs> So I watched her for about nine months. I thought, mm, uh-huh. Now, if you don't know black features, you may think she's laughing, but she wasn't laughing. She was simply extending her lips and making a sound. <laughs> I said, oh, I see. That's that survival apparatus. Now, let me write about that to honor this woman who helps us to survive. By her very survival, Miss Rosie, through your destruction, I stand up. So I used the poem with Mr. Paul Lawrence Dunbar's poem, Masks, and my own poem for old black men. Mr. Dunbar wrote Masks in 1892. We wear the mask that grins and lies. It shades our cheeks and hides our eyes. 
this debt we pay to human God. With torn and bleeding heart, we smile and mouth with myriad subtleties. Why should the world be overwise in counting all our tears and sighs? Nay, let them only see us while we wear the mask. We smile, but oh my God, our tears to thee from tortured souls arise. And we sing, hey baby Biden, we sing, hey, but oh, the clay is vile beneath our feet and long the mile. But let the world think otherwise. We wear the mask. When I think about myself, <laughs> I almost laugh myself to death. My life has been one great big joke, a dance that's walked, a song was spoke. I laugh so hard. <laughs> I almost choke when I think about myself. 70 years in these folks' world, the child I works for calls me girl. I say, <laughs> yes, ma'am, for working's sake. I'm too proud to bend and too poor to break. So <laughs> I laugh until my stomach ache when I think about myself. My folks can make me split my side. I laugh so hard, <laughs> I nearly died. The tales they tell sound just like lying. They grow the fruit, but eat the rind. <laughs> I laugh <laughs> until I start to cry when I think about myself and my folks and the little children. My fathers sit on benches. Their flesh count every plank. The slats leave dents of darkness deep in their withered flank and they nod like broken candles, all waxed and burnt profound. They say, but sugar, it was our submission that made your world go round. There in those pleated faces, I see the auction block the chains and slavery's coffles, the whip and lash and stock. My father speak in voices that shred my fact and sound. They say, but sugar, it was our submission and that made your world go round. They laughed to shield their crying. They shuffled through their dreams. They stepped and fetched the country and wrote the blues in screams. I understand their meaning. It could and did derive from living on the ledge of death. They kept my race alive by wearing the mask. <laughs> <laughs> to show that because I think it speaks to again this level of masks she mentioned the masks we that we wear masks and that's what the poem was based on and how can we have our full authentic human self Someone talked about in the comments, I don't remember who, um, it, it, a little further back, about um, not wanting to be angry all the time. And especially for Black women, that comes with it a certain connotation. Um, there have been multiple ways in which there has not been an allowance for the full range of emotion, full range of human experience to be expressed that being um, a level of oppression. And, you know, we can equate it to not necessarily having a fully realized emotional equity in society. And as some of us may be psychologists in this, in this space, what does that mean, even as psychologists, to 
in our training where some of that might even be separated from the work that we do and in patients that we see needing to help patients to um, fully realize and embrace all of their full emotional range. What does that mean for us as psychologists to not have that even within our field? Um, and how can we make that a part of the work that we do? How can we make that a part of the healing um, process to be able to enact the full range of humanity? Um, so I want to open it up, see what people's thoughts are, reactions. I see there's a lot of comments here. One person said to be, to be black and conscious is to know madness. Shouldn't we acknowledge our rage? That's from Paul. Mm -hmm. And previous to that, Stephen said, emotional labor. I heard there was a study of Pam Stewardess's, among other sin, since the late 60s, that studied um, the effects of them smiling falsely all the time. Um, what it had an effect on them smiling falsely. And apparently it alienated them from their own real emotions and led to them feeling numb. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I'm, I'm going to speak first to um, Paul's question. I, I know that name, uh, Paul White Davis. Um, and I'm going to speak to that just by saying, why shouldn't we acknowledge our rage? And in some ways, that's the full range of human experience. Part of human experience is rage, yeah. is anger. And what affords us not the ability to do that? And I, that is part of that white supremacy culture that we're talking about. Right. How do we then move differently to be able to dismantle white supremacy culture? Colleen, and maybe that's partly showing our age. What's that? I'm sorry, I interrupted you, someone. No. Colleen, you're saying something? OK. OK. Hi. Um, I just had to, so that poem made me have to turn on my camera and unmute myself. <laughs> I have to say your full name, Dr. Tanya White Davis, because um, it just reminded me so much of the ways in which I find myself silencing myself. Being so careful with words, tone of voice, your posture, your facial expressions. Um, and like I described constantly, you know, wearing that mask, putting that smile on your face and just the struggle of that and how to kind of be your authentic self and also, you know, care for yourself. And that always feels like a struggle, whether, especially in predominantly white places or at work, you know, the risk of what it means to truly be authentic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Adua. And it's, it has been a risk. There's been multiple risks throughout time, throughout our throughout generations for people to be able, especially black people, to show that full range of emotion. It's come with literal consequences often to your life. And so if we're in a space right now um, where people are talking about change and demanding change, mm -hmm. what does that mean as far as emotional equity? Thank you so much, Adwa, for sharing that. Go ahead. Is it even possible for black people to truly let loose or acknowledge the rage that they have? I mean, how is that possible? Realistically, I mean, you, you touched upon this. You, you indicated, particularly for black women, the connotations that go with expressing that um, um, that rage, that that that. How is it? How is it possible for us to be able to express that rage without the connotations and negativity that goes along with that? I mean, we talk about often, particularly in in in, in with current affairs, 
how black parents have to have talks, have to have the talk with their sons. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. we don't get the luxury of being able to express our rage as human beings mm -hmm. on an equal footing. Mm -hmm. We don't get to be pulled over by a police officer who wrongly asked us to step out of our car over a traffic violation and uh, go on the sidewalk and put our hands over our heads and question that. We, we're not allowed to do that. And if it's wrong, even if we know that our rights are being violated, we don't have the luxury of being able to challenge that because we know that there's a good chance we're not going to make it out of that encounter. Um, so do we have a, a basis for our rage? Of course. Is it is it wrong for us? Is it probably best that we acknowledge it amongst ourselves? You know, not in mixed company, certainly. But to express that in the larger society, I don't know how we can effectively do that. We can try to channel it. We can channel it into positive activities that could uplift our people. But in terms of truly acknowledging it, just as a human being in the larger society, I don't know how that can be effectively accomplished. Thank you. So I'm going to acknowledge Doc, uh, Dr. Theopia Jackson, who's also mentioned um, when rage is acknowledged and embraced, it can be the fuel for intentional action and change. Right. And I think we are seeing large levels of rage um, being enacted in a collective sense yeah. in the streets, in how people are um, uh, relating to policies, how people are relating to police. Um, so the rage is, is being more in the forefront than I think in other spaces, another time. I had saw a hand somewhere. Um, Bryles Burles Austin. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for the moment. And thank the ancestors for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, I agree that yes, we are struggling to find ways in which to express uh, our uh, rage, our anger, our dissatisfaction with a lot of the circumstances that we've had to confront for a long time. Uh, but the hope that I have is uh, centered on rebuilding the, the uh, African personality that I think is the basis of what we as Black people bring to American society is an African perspective, or at least one that is spiritually grounded in African spirituality. So I, um, I offer that as a, as a option for us to consider. Thank you. We have another comment. Comrades, our mindset has been conditioned for centuries. What our ancestors suffered, we are also suffering. And if we don't wake up to work on the concept of reprogramming the mindset so that our offsprings will inherit a better informed mindset, they will also suffer the same misfortune. This is about the system, not white individuals. And um, Kay said, we express the rage in the safe spaces that designated for us and with us. And R said, I really love the work of Resmar Menachem, my, grandmother, my grandmother's hand. White supremacy comes from trauma that has not been processed and passed to black bodies. It has begun to really ground my work with white clients who recognize their discomfort with their white identity in the context of a racist society. And someone said, not knowing is that an example of spiritual wellness, of, of spiritual illness, 
or the psychopath racial personality disorders in the view of Dr. Bobby Wright. And we're Dr. T. Axiological world views tends to frame behaviors and that the institutional vestiges of racism, white supremacy have acted as the insular space in which white people are and have not been, been willing to know and where denial becomes that action place by default that black lives doesn't matter. In ethics, this is a place where indifference operates at the societal level. Thank you. I also want to acknowledge, um, Dr. Jackson mentioned, we have been conditioned to embrace and almost glorify how much we can endure and suffer. This is intentional so that we do not recognize our rage, which leaves us vulnerable to being reactive to our rage versus proactive. Ashante Sana, brother. Thank you. We have um, one more hand, uh, yes, Thurston yes. Charles. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you, comrades. Uh, and I have been uh, sending just some, uh, some few messages about the conditioning of the mindset because this has been done by the system. The individuals that we are talking about, the whites, they are just servants in the system. No matter what we do, no matter what we discuss, if we don't address the system that is in place, even those that they have given birth to are going to inherit the very actions that they are doing, and they, the same cycle will repeat even to our children. We need to look at the system and how it has been framed in a way that uh, people of color are not given the privilege but they have the freedom. Brothers and sisters, you can have any freedom you want, but if you don't have the privileges to determine what kind of freedom you're going to enjoy, you will again be under, or you will be a subject to the system because the system is controlled by certain people that you don't see. How do you express your rage to a system? Are you going to go in the street to everyone Perhaps I should ask a question. Do you realize that the Black Lives Matter is a setup by those who control the system? We are going to continue suffering this kind of, uh, you know, brutality. We are going to continue suffering all kinds of, uh, you know, misusing us simply because we do not see those who set up the systems in which we are inoculated from a young age and we grow up thinking that the system that are in society are for the good of the people or uh, like common people like everyone in the same way but when actually the system is favoring certain people and just sub subordinating uh, uh, other people so what we are talking about is just an iceberg the, who controls the iceberg? It's those who print money. People who print money are controlling the systems and we need to address who controls the system that we are seeing in society doing things the way they are doing. So right. thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Brother Charles. So I, I know we are out of time, um, but I do want to just say thank you. Um, the system is you know, and not inducted and, and, and full and developed on white supremacy. And we are, in essence, the work is to dismantle the white supremacy system that we are in. Um, and racism in and of itself as expressed by Ibram Kendi is a collection, a system of racist policies that lead to racial inequity and is substantiated by racist ideas. So putting that onus into the system and the people are, um, you know, an actors of that system. So thank you everyone for your, there's so many uh, wonderful comments. I wish we would have been able to get to every one of them and, and talk more about them. Um, but I do wanna make sure that we are ending on time and I know we're a minute over. Thank you so much. My sister.
My sister, I know, um, sorry to interject, I just want to, I, I know time has passed, but I just wanted to bring to attention this. Um, my brother that just spoke, and myself here as well, we are around the world. I'm, I'm from Britain, all right? My brother is, is from um, Uganda um, oh, and resides there. And beloved, I'm gonna lovingly, beloved, I'm going to lovingly interrupt only because I had my hand raised. And it was announced that time was done. A male spoke, and then another male is speaking right now. Right? Oh, I'm sorry, so okay. I think if there's All more right. time, then I certainly got a comment. If not, though, I understand it. But I want to call us to task on addressing mm -hmm. how white supremacy can show up with honoring male privilege. Mm -hmm. okay. I was just gonna. Thank I was you. just Thank gonna give thanks. I was just giving so, thanks for the fact that I am, this is around the world. Thank you so much for acknowledging that's, that it's around the world. And uh, yes. Fabian Snowden. Yes, that's and thank you, brother. It's all love. That's the space I'm coming from. Sure. And do you have a, a comment, uh, Fabian? Fabian. Thank, you. thank you for that, Fabian. I really appreciate the additional time. I'll make it even quicker. One of the terms that I have found very supportive to bring in the conversation, to bring in an individual level conversation more to a macro level, is the sentence that white lives don't matter. And I think this sentence can have a number of responses and reactions, but then looking at how the lives of specific people matter, the lives of specific cultures matter. But lives are challenging since Black lives identifying. Okay, well then, thank you. Thank so, you. Uh, Lisa, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Whitten. I just wanted to uh, suggest that you show um, or mention a couple of the other books that you had in your co in your PowerPoint slides that people might want to check out. Okay, thank you. Um, we do have a couple other things that I wanted to show you. Um, Just really quickly, this was the, um, just so we can have a good understanding of how it might show up, white fragility in your life, um, argumentation, fear and guilt, silence and leaving the stress inducing situation are certain ways in which the behavior of white fragility manifests. Um, but I also want to just um, point to Ibram Kendi, X. Kendi's book on how to be an anti-racist, um, where he really articulates very well how um, this white supremacy culture uh, is enacted and um, how uh, racism is, and specifically uh, response to that being anti-racism needs to unfold. So I definitely encourage everyone to read this book. Um, and that's that's it for now. I know we are over time. So thank you. I know that there's also a poll or something. Um, yes, yes, yes. Thank you all again. Um, it um, appears that people uh, very much needed this and uh, we appreciate the different viewpoints uh, and we also recognize a need, uh, recognize that um, there's a need for continued conversation around this. Um, so we would like to um, uh, revisit this. Um, so stay tuned for that. I, I included a link in the chat box that will allow um, everyone to join our mailing list. And that is uh, um, a good way to keep abreast of our events. I do want to launch a quick poll um, to just take a couple of minutes. It, it will help us to uh, continue to spread the word about our events. So if everybody could do that, I would really, we would all really appreciate it. And really thank you everyone for all of your um, comments, for sharing your thoughts, for being here, your presence. Um, and thank you for, for being you. Yes, this is a very powerful event. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Asante Sana. Thank you. Asante Sana.